So with a round of applause, let's welcome our panelists to the front table. Thank you, Liz. Uh, thank you to my fellow uh, panelists. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank Chairman Villarakis and the Hellenic Caucus for the invitation to brief you this afternoon on the importance of the Healthy Seminary for International Religious Freedom. Uh, I also want to express my appreciation to the House Foreign Affairs Committee uh, and their recognition of the Healthy Seminary as a U.S. foreign policy issue with human rights, security, and strategic significance for our country. Uh, as a former commissioner and vice chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, and as a member now of the Secretary of State's Religion and Foreign Policy Working Group under the Strategic Dialogue with Civil Society, I'm gravely concerned by the four-plus decades closure of the Halki Seminary in Turkey. To put it very succinctly, the unrelenting refusal of the government of the Republic of Turkey to reopen Halki underscored yet again with the democratization reform package that was submitted by Prime Minister Erdogan to this parliament on 30 September, October 1 of this year. It should be recognized for what it is. Namely, Halki is the symbolic and practical centerpiece of the Turkish government's systematic violations of international religious freedom rights for the Greek Orthodox citizens of Turkey. And it's the linchpin of a set of policies that have placed the very survival of the ethnical patriarchate and Greek Orthodox Christians in Turkey at risk. Uh, indeed, Halki is a clear metric of Ankara's deliberate policies of religious cleansing, which threatened to erase a 2,000 year presence of Greek Orthodox Christians in Asia Minor. Uh, and in this regard, the fate of the Halki Seminary is also an indicator of Turkey's conformity to a pattern of gross violations of religious freedom and human rights crimes. Uh, by states and other non-state actors in the greater Middle East. The means and the mechanisms may be different, but the outcome is the same. And in Syria, Iraq, Turkish occupied Cyprus, with echoes of Egypt, Iran, and elsewhere. So for US policymakers, how he needs to be understood as an echo chamber for international religious freedom concerns in Turkey and beyond. Although Elizabeth gave you a, a brief introduction about the history of Halki, uh, I'd like to sort of demystify Halki for, for all of you who are here, um, for, in particular for uh, Congressional Committee staff. Um, so let me give you a thumbnail sketch. The Holy Theological School of Halki was actually established, as Elizabeth said, in the mid-19th century on one of the princess islands called Hegelada uh, in the Ottoman Empire. And it's actually the school, the seminary, is part of a larger complex of buildings that includes the Holy Trinity Monastery, that dates back to the Byzantine period, as well as a rich library that's a repository of classical and uh, Christian texts. From its establishment in 1844 until its closure during the 1971 coup in Turkey, here's what Halki did so that you know the uh, functions that it performed. Uh, first, um, it, was, it met the higher education needs of the ecumenical patriarchate and all of its churches in Turkey, and more broadly, under the global jurisdiction of the ecumenical patriarchate. That's hundreds of millions of Orthodox Christians around the world. Secondly, how he trained priests and hierarchs for the Holy Synod of the Ecumenical Patriarchy. This is important because this uh, effectively sustained the succession and governance of the Ecumenical Patriarchy as a religious institution. Third, uh, how he was an institution that served for higher learning for Orthodox Christians at risk in other parts of the world. Uh, this is, uh, was particularly important for Orthodox Christians uh, in European uh, communist countries during the Cold War, and it's even important today for Orthodox Christians who fa face uh, enormous uh, survival challenges in the greater Middle East, in places like Antioch, Alexandria, in Iraq, in Beirut, and also in, uh, in other parts of the region. And then finally, Halki has always been uh, a source of uh, cosmopolitan ideas about interfaith tolerance and respect for religious pluralism. And to put it in today's parlance, um, how he then has produced leaders and ideas and therefore behaviors and actions uh, that have been important for countering violent extremism. So that's a brief thumbnail sketch, a sketch of, of why Halki, what Halki does and why it matters. Uh, over historical time, it's operated varyingly as a theological or graduate school, uh, but also as a combined high school and graduate theological school. Now, the free, unimpeded operation of Halki is a sign of one for the religious freedom rights of Greek Orthodox Christians in Turkey. 
freedom of thought, conscience, and belief, as well as associated rights of worship, association, and practice, are the foundation of international human rights standards on religious freedom. That means whether we're talking about Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, Article 18 of the, um, uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or in the European context, Article 9 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So the closure of Halki, a uh, 43-year closure of Halki, almost 43 years, uh, means that uh, basic human rights, international human rights norms and standards are being violated willingly by uh, the government of the Republic of Turkey. Uh, it's worth stressing one particular linkage, the practical implications of depriving the ecumenical patriarchy of the right to train clergy and hierarchy it is, is very simple and it needs to be underscored. It's the eradication, it's, it's leading to the eradication of the Greek Orthodox community in Turkey. The linkage again is worth clarifying in terms of human rights frameworks. Without priests and hierarchs, it's impossible for there to be communal worship. It's impossible for the church to be church. Without priests and hierarchs, there is no governance structure. There's no succession, stru succession structure. But without priests and hierarchs, there's no teaching, there's no education, there's no observance. So in other words, how can be thought of as a core issue, almost a tipping point in the difference between the survival versus the extinction of uh, Greek Orthodox Christians in Turkey. Now, how does Turkey justify the violation of international human rights laws and norms on the Halki issue, despite the fact that the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs maintains that, quote, the promotion and protection of human rights are among the priority policy objectives of Turkey, and that Turkish reforms are aimed at aligning the country's legislation with the EU and due regard to the European Convention on Human Rights, unquote. It's very simple. Uh, Halki was originally closed in 1971 as part of the military coup. It was actually closed uh, under the, the guidance of the under, uh, direction of the National Education Directory, Directorate or the Higher Education Council, YOK, Y-O-K is the acronym. Uh, and this falls under, this directorate falls under the direct purview of the Turkish Prime Minister. The proximate cause for the closure and the ongoing justification for uh, the continuing shuttering of the institution is that all private schools of higher education have to be shut down, and certainly the private religious higher education schools run counter to secular, secularism as one of the pillars of the Turkish constitution. Uh, Turkish state officials, however, have been increasingly explicit and categorical about the core reason, the actual reason for keeping healthy closed. Turkey's uh, Minister of EU Affairs, Egan Mbaiz, put it succinctly in a recent press conference in Brussels uh, regarding the late, latest democratization package. He summed up Turkey's healthy policy, saying, uh, we work according to the principle of reciprocity. Uh, this means that healthy's opening is uh, explicitly linked now by the Turkish government to Turkish-Greek bilateral relations. Uh, Prime Minister Erdogan has expanded on the reciprocity explanation for what his Minister of EU Affairs and his Deputy Prime Minister, Bahia Bozai, uh, explained as the deliberate exclusion of Halki from the democratization reform package. He used the following terms. He said that he made it crystal clear that Halki, the Halki issue is a political issue for Turkey. It's not a human rights issue. It's not an international law issue. For the Turkish state, it's a political issue. Erdogan says the reopening of the school is a matter of minutes for Turkey, with no legal barriers remaining. But why should we always give? We ask for reciprocity. What's the bottom line here? The reciprocity principle, uh, it, that position obfuscates deliberately um, an issue that is a simple, straightforward issue of international human rights law and religious freedom. It obfuscates it uh, behind the, the umbrella or under the umbrella of bilateral relations with Greece and Turkey. Uh, it's a non-starter, in other words, uh, to think about um, the Halki issue for the Turkish government as a human rights issue. They treat it explicitly as a political issue. And here, just to wrap up this section and move to conclusion, I also want to underscore the fact that uh, the Halki Seminary uh, is an issue that extends well beyond the, the, the opening of the seminary itself. Because what it does is it lays bare the fact that the Turkish state and the bilateral, the, the reciprocity linkages, the Turkish state doesn't view its Greek Orthodox citizens Greek Orthodox Christians as citizens who are equal before the state in Turkey and who have equality before the law. 
So Halki exposes the long-standing view that the Turkish state has viewed the Greek Orthodox uh, community in Turkey as a security threat, something that um, indeed would be comical if it weren't so tragic. Uh, today, there are between 1,700 and 2,000 Greek Orthodox Christians in all of Turkey. That's less than one-tenth of one percent of the entire population of the country. So the notion that they comprise a security threat is, requires one to suspend this belief. Uh, but again, Halki is a um, Halki and the view that it gives us about how Turkey views its Greek Orthodox citizens is instructive because it speaks to them the broader basket of policies that the government has used uh, to uh, to reduce the community to its, its current numbers. These policies include a history of pogroms, property rights confiscation, economic disenfranchisement, and the continuing Islamization of Greek Orthodox churches by turning them into mosques. So in this regard, the Turkish state has succeeded in cleansing its population almost completely of Greek Orthodox Christians. Uh, now moving to conclusion, we arrive at the related question of what is to be done and why should the United States care? Let me begin here by saying uh, that it's encouraging to know that the House Committee on Foreign Affairs within the Subcommittee on Europe, Eurasia, and Emerging Threats will take up Resolution 188, calling upon the government of Turkey to facilitate the reopening of the Ecumenical Patriarchate's Theological School of Halki without condition or further delay. This resolution uh, indicates that the United States recognizes that support for the reopening of Halki Seminary reflects America's values and interests. Halki is an important test, a litmus test, for the strategic value of U.S.-Turkey relations. Can American presidents take seriously the statements of their Turkish counterparts or of Turkish executives when, after all, Prime Minister Erdogan has done a bold face after accepting President Obama's March 2012 congratulatory statements about the decision to reopen Halki? More generally, it's worth pointing out that every single U.S. president, from Carter, President Carter through President Obama, has raised Halki, underscoring uh, a long overlooked fact that in terms of U.S.-Turkish bilateral relations, there's been absolutely no movement forward on the resolution of the Halki Seminary issue. Turkey is an important United States ally, and presumably this is an issue that um, there should be some movement on. Uh, if Halki remains closed, there are also demonstration effects that are very concerning for U.S. foreign policy. If Halki remains closed and the U.S. remains indifferent to the endangered status of Greek Orthodox Christians, this sends a dangerous message to Turkey about the, rising, the acceptability of the rising anti-Semitism that's seen a 30% drop, 30% drop in Turkey's Jewish community, Turkey's Jewish population since 2009. And that's been reflected in Prime Minister Erdogan's insidious anti-Semitic statements about a Jewish hand and an Israeli Jewish interest rate lobby as the causes behind the summer Jesse Park demonstrations. At a time when gross violations of religious freedom are threatening to extinguish the Christian presence in the greater Middle East, but also have generated unprecedented cycles of violence, sectarian and communal violence uh, across uh, other lines. Turkey's stand on Halki and its treatment of its own minorities can either further aggregate, uh, aggravate or begin to ameliorate regional uh, instability in an area of great uh, strategic interest for the U.S. In closing, the U.S. does have foreign policy options at its, at its disposal, and these bear urgent consideration. The U.S. has committed itself to the promotion and protection of international religious freedom under the International Religious Freedom Act. Consequently, the U.S. had designated Turkey as a country of particular concern in its 2012 annual report, including Alki's closure as part of the assessment of quote, the Turkish government's systematic and courageous limitations on freedom of religion or belief that affect all religious communities in Turkey and particularly threaten the country's non-Muslim religious minorities. The time has come for a reversal in USERP's baseless two-tier upgrading of Turkey to other countries monitored the next 2013, since after all, Halki's continued closure flies in the face of the claim that Turkey is moving in a uh, parallel to U.S.-EU free trade zone discussions, provides another mechanism for incentivizing the reopening of health. Turkey's willingness to take seriously U.S. concerns about the seminary and protection of international religious freedom I would submit would go a long way to show how seriously Turkey takes its interest in economic gains of a new trade and investment for in the U.S. And indeed, there is precedent in terms of U.S. foreign policy of incentivizing economic relationships based on human rights. <coughs> That's the Jackson-Vanagon uh, of the late 1970s. 
Thank you for your attention. I apologize for my quick speech, but I was trying to be loyal to the time allotted to me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Podrubin. As we welcome Dr. Lambarakis to the podium, just wanted to mention that uh, even though we don't have any current members present, one former senator is enough to carry the weight, and I wanted to welcome oh. Senator uh, Paul Sarbanes. I've been asked to speak on the efforts of the Order of St. Andrew in our quest to obtain religious freedom for the ecumenical patriarchate, and that is our mission. In fact, no other mission of an organization is focused in this uh, singular focus, and that is to serve the ecumenical patriarchate, but we're also fighting for religious freedom for the religious minorities that comprise Turkey. It's a multifaceted domestic and international strategy that we have developed, but I wanted to remind everyone, especially those who are not Orthodox Christians, and I see Archon Paul Sarbanes, let me publicly thank you for all you've done in support of religious freedom, Senator. We're very grateful. But Orthodox Christianity, I need uh, help with the slide there, we, we uh, number some 300 million Orthodox Christians around the world, it's comprised of autocephalous patri or patriarchal churches. Each church retains its independence while remaining committed to unity and faith and worship. These are the primarily Orthodox Christian countries around the world. And the ecumenical patriarchate in that context, context is first among all the Orthodox Christian churches. And this is an important slide because this demonstrates the canonical connection of the United States of America to the ecumenical patriarchate. We indeed fall under the jurisdiction of the ecumenical patriarchate, and as American citizens of the Orthodox Christian Church of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America, we are connected to the Mother Church through Canon 28, which was passed in the Fourth Ecumenical Council 1,500 years ago, that granted jurisdiction of all barbaric countries outside the empire, outside the patriarchal churches, to the ecumenical patriarchate. So that, 1,500 years ago, connected the United States of America to the ecumenical patriarchate and the archons of America under the guidance of Archbishop Demetrius. Number one, we had an opportunity to express our concerns on religious freedom to the people at 60 Minutes. That one episode on 60 Minutes in one hour's program did more to educate the entire international community on the religious freedom crisis in Turkey than any other singular uh, item over the years. When Bob Simon, the most senior journalist at 60 Minutes, asked that famous question, Your All Holiness, do you feel crucified in your own country? And courageously, the Patriarch, His All Holiness, the Ecumenical Patriarch, said, Yes, I do. Great. Now, understand that this is a Patriarch whose predecessors were often violently removed from their office. One was hanged not that long ago during the independence for Greece. But that 60 Minutes program caused an introspection in Turkey, and in fact, in the Turkish press, and he started asking, yeah, maybe we are crucifying this patriarch. It was a two-year project, and as I said, it also led to two other 60-minute programs on religious persecution regarding the exodus of Christians from the Holy Land, and also a very interesting segment on the monks of Mount Athos. And for this, and for the reasons of promoting religious freedom, demonstrating to the world that religious persecution exists in a democratic state in Turkey, the Order of St. Andrew bestowed through the hands of the Archbishop the 2013 Athena Lotus Human Rights Award. And here's problems that is all holiness faces are five in number, and I'll go through them quick, quickly. No legal personality, severe restrictions on property, Tremendous property confiscations by the government. Interference in the selection of the ecumenical patriarch. 
does not recognize the government, the term ecumenical. But the, the subject of today's briefing, the forcible closure of Halki Seminary. Beautiful island off the coast of Constantinople, present day Istanbul. It was a, a, a holy hill of learning since 1840 when it first opened. But yet it was ecumenical patriarch Photios who established the monastery of the Holy Trinity on that island where this complex resides. So it's not just a seminary, it's on a monastery that was established by one of the great ecumenical patriarchs, Halki Seminary. Now, His All Holiness has been promised by the government officials that the, the school will open. The school will open, the school will open. Here, here are the words of His All Holiness. We have the promise of the Prime Minister, of the Minister of Education, of the EU negotiator, all hollow promises. And then the coup de grace, if you will, is when the President of the United States, on what day? March 25th, this is a Office of the Press Secretary, White House, March 25, 2012, when President Obama said, I am very pleased to hear this decision to reopen the Halki Seminary in Hypedalia. After 42 years, innumerable broken promises, disingenuous government pronouncements, Halki Seminary remains closed. And that's the fact. We ask, will Halki be the Berlin Wall of Turkey, representing division, injustice, and denial of human rights? We call on the Prime Minister to open the doors of Halki just as President Reagan called on Mikhail Gorbachev to tear down this wall. One other thing that's very troubling that just occurred and that has been happening is the circumstance in which ancient churches in Turkey that were forcibly converted into mosques under the Ottomans and then changed into museums by Ataturk demonstrating Turkey's look to the West and embracing Western democratic ideals are now being converted back to mosques. Now what are Christians to think in that circumstance? Are Christians welcome in Turkey or are they not welcome in Turkey? Is this an inclusive democracy or is this a theocracy that is developing, which is exclusive? This church was the church where the first ecumenical council was convened in 325. This was the church in which the Nicene Creed, Nicaea, Nicene Creed, that all Christians utilized, was established, and that was just converted last year in July 2012 to a mosque. It was a museum, it was converted to a mosque. It is another St. Sophia in Traps on off the Black Sea, Built in 1238, one of the finest examples of Byzantine architecture. It was a museum, and now it's converted to a mosque. This past July, July 5th, where they did the first Friday Ramadan prayers. Pro Deputy Prime Minister Arendt, in fact, prides himself in the conversion of these two St. Sophia museums to mosques, and he has his sights set on this St. Sophia, the original St. Sophia, the first church known as the Great Church of Christ, which is a museum. The original church was built by the son of St. Constantine the Great, Constantine Bilarakis, our congressman. The current edifice was built by Justinian. It was our Orthodox Christian cathedral for over a thousand years. But that is, that is the aim of the Deputy Prime Minister to convert that church, that museum today, into a mosque. It's outrageous. We're able to get 90 senators, 90 senators agree on one thing, which is remarkable in this Congress, and that was to 
call on Turkey to grant religious freedom to the ecumenical patriarchy. We worked with the Manitas team to sign a letter also regarding religious freedom from the House Foreign Affairs Committee. There have been important visits to the ecumenical patriarchy. Most recently, December 3rd, Vice President Joe Biden visited His All Holiness in the Patriarchate. His Eminence hosted, guided the visitation. This past April, Secretary of State John Kerry visited the ecumenical patriarchate. There's Ambassador Richard Doney, His All Holiness. I have to publicly thank Elizabeth Prodromo, who was the former commissioner and vice chair at the United States Commission of International Religious Freedom, USERF, for really focusing in on Turkey. As you know, in 2009, 2010, Turkey was a watch list country. You know, there are three levels of religious freedom violators. Turkey was named the second worst level, 2010, 2011. 2012, it went from a watch list to a country of particular concern, which is the very worst level of religious freedom. The worst countries on religious freedom are on the watch list on the country of particular concern. And Turkey was that until 2013. And for some reason, they were downgraded two whole levels, which we, which we feel was grossly unjustified. And in fact, a few months back, the Archon leadership went to uh, the chairman, Dr. Katrina Lantos Sweat, Lantos Sweat, Lantos is a congressional name well known here, to protest that to that almost unprecedented to the uh, down step uh, improvement in their religious freedom designation. We're very proud of the work of our uh, state religious freedom resolutions in the 50 states throughout the country. In, in 2008, 15 states in the United States adopted religious freedom resolutions in their state legislatures. In 2013, that went to 42 states. We're still having trouble with Idaho and Montana, and New Hampshire, by the way. They haven't introduced anything for religious freedom in their state legislatures. And Minnesota, Indiana, Ohio, and Maryland, and Hawaii are also states that have not cooperated, quite frankly. But we're working on it. And I have to say, this is an effort from the very ground roots. The archons at the various states and if this isn't an example of government of the people, by the people, and for the people, I don't know what else is. So our Archbishop, uh, we visit the, the EU presidency nations and bring this up at the OSCE, and, and uh, Dr. Adamandiadis is here. We're getting ready to launch a religious freedom conference in Berlin, Germany. The theme of that is tearing down walls. George Rockus is chairing that. Here we are working with our State Department in Berlin, our ambassador to Berlin. Here we are at the Bundestag. So this is going to be an extraordinary uh, two-day conference. Uh, we will always work with our, our diplomats from Greece, from Cyprus, and we go to Turkey. We're, whatever city we are, we go to Greece, Cyprus, and Turkey ambassadors and inform them of the work of trying to secure religious freedom for the ecumenical patriarchy. And finally, we work in Turkey itself. Here is uh, Professor Gormaz, and this is Deputy Prime Minister Bulan Arinç, who wants to make St. Sophia a mosque. And we meet with the minorities of Turkey, the Jews, the Protestants, the Catholics, the Armenians, the Syriacs, and 17 million Alevi Muslims. Thank you very much for your attention. And let us all work for religious freedom, a fundamental right that we enjoy here in the United States that just does not exist in Turkey. Well, uh, regarding Halki, we've been given broken promises for decades. Uh, what's particularly troubling now is the threat to reopen some of the most sacred, formerly Christian churches into mosques. Two of them have, has already, two, uh, 
a museum, a previous church converted to mosque during the Ottoman times, made into a museum by Ataturk in his quest to democratize and westernize Turkey. Now, the deputy prime minister prides himself, Aranj Bulat, uh, uh, Bulat Aranj, uh, in converting these museums into practicing mosques. Happened twice. Now they have their sights aimed at the great Saint Sophia in Constantinople, Istanbul, that they want to convert into a mosque. And they're talking about it publicly, and it's very, very alarming. Very alarming. There's been no progress on Halki, despite 42 years of closure. There's been very little progress regarding property confiscations. Thousands of properties have been confiscated. Very few, if any, well, very few have been returned. They require Turkish citizenship to vote on our hierarchs to become ecumenical patriarch. So the, the issues of religious freedom continue to fester in Turkey. They always talk about if this country does this, and that country does that, then we will do this. Well, reciprocity does not relate to basic fundamental human rights, and that's an acknowledged uh, concept and tenet in all diplomatic uh, fields. Thank you. I just wanted to briefly uh, welcome the Deputy Archbishop of New Jersey here, and I want to thank Dr. Anthony Lindbergh-Rakis and, and all the archons who may be joining us today for their continued advocacy on this very important issue of what the ecumenical patriarchate faces uh, day in, day out. I also want to salute uh, my colleague, Gus Bill-Rakis, who will be here momentarily, had a meeting just after the vote, but he's, he's on his way, and thank him for uh, convening the session here. Uh, on the hill. When it comes to Kalki, it's just a string of broken promises. As Dr. Limberakis just indicated, assurances given, assurances retracted and pulled away. Uh, most recently, uh, the, the Turkish government has put forward another set of preconditions. Uh, they said that they, uh, they need to be encouraged to do the right thing with respect to Kalki, but they've added a whole set of preconditions that weren't even there before. So they keep moving the goalposts, and, and frankly, that conduct is shameful. And it's right to bring attention to these issues. And again, I want to thank the gentleman uh, for joining us today uh, to make those very powerful points. Thank you. Congressman Sears from New Jersey. Congressman, welcome to Washington. You know, this has been a long fight, and we'll continue the fight. Luckily, I have uh, good friends, and I certainly, the human rights issue is, is very important to me, and religion, the expression of religion, extremely important to me. So we will continue the fight from here. Yesterday, we passed a resolution, or I can introduce a resolution on the uh, European Committee, and we're going to make sure that it goes to the full committee and pass that resolution to open up the school. So uh, I will continue to work with my colleagues, and we got to keep the fight going. We can't stop. We have to, you know, move, move forward with the, with the fight. I've been to Cyprus. It's the same issue as Cyprus. A lot of lies. A lot of concessions that never, they never keep up. And I visited some of the church that are, that are hundreds of years old that are riding away. So. You know, that's just not acceptable to me, and I will do everything I can while I'm in Congress to make sure that we do the right thing for the people of Cyprus and Greece. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, uh, thank you so very sorry, much go for being here. Uh, tell Abio if we get a, a Greek and a Cuban to run this place, I think it'd be we can get a lot of things done. He's a wonderful person and a great advocate for, for Greece, Cyprus, and for Arthur Skia. But thank you very much for being here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, this is a, an issue uh, affecting Christians, 300 million Christians around the world, Eastern Orthodox Christians, but I know the entire Christian community here in the United States and all over the world cares about this particular issue. Thank you very much. I know you had great presentations here. Uh, with our Archbishop, what an honor to have him here, uh, your eminence, and of course Dr. Liberakis, who is my, but this is so very important. And uh, again, we get a lot of promises, but we need some action. And we're not going to rest until the school is open.
So, Sasha Karisto, Vital Holi, thank you so much. Get your members to co-sponsor the resolution. It's so very important. We can get it out of the full committee. Dana did a wonderful job yesterday. And then here's our hero, uh, Chairman Royce. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't want to make it. As you know, we here in the House of Representatives are very concerned, very concerned about uh, close off the ability of the next generation of those who would teach the faith. And of particular importance to us is the institution of health care to make certain that it is allowed to be run uh, by the Greek Orthodox Church, that it is allowed to be to recruit and to teach. And here is my concern. We are down to a population of less than 1% uh, from a population that originally would have been, if we go back in time, prior to the Armenian Genocide, 30% of um, Anatolia, of Turkey today, would have been minority populations. And we know, all of us, what happened with respect to the genocide uh, in 1915. But the problem is not just the impact of the genocide. The problem is that on an ongoing basis, the destruction of churches, the lack of respect for the authority of the church to, uh, to teach, and the attempts to prevent religious freedom, the refusal to return these artifacts. I passed a re resolution some years ago to call for this, and we are putting pressure on the government of Turkey to do it. But in point of fact, uh, we need to ratchet that pressure up at this time. Turkey seeks uh, a closer relationship with Europe, with uh, the European Union. Well, now is the time to say, all right, one of the preconditions is religious freedom in all of Turkey, and that includes for the minorities, including the Christian minority. So welcome to the People's House, to the House of Representatives, and uh, we're, we're very honored by your questions. Something 
unreasonable, unthinkable, and ultimately unacceptable. But it happened. It happened, and we hope that's a very temporary thing, a bizarre kind of political acrobatics, which won't last. Lo and behold, 40 plus years after, we are still with Salafi I remember the day, November 17, 1999. November 17, 1999, we were in the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and it was a time when President Clinton, a sitting president at that time, was visiting Constantinople, Istanbul. He had some meetings with Turkish officials, and we were almost certain that he would come to the Patriarchate and bring the good news. So we were ready for that. The Patriarch asked me to go down to the main entrance and welcome the President and bring him up to the office of the Patriarch. Here comes President Clinton, Mrs. Clinton, Chelsea Clinton was with there, Mrs. Albright was with there, and the chairman of the security council, the federal government, and I see the faces are not shining. I say, no, we don't have good news. But anyhow, we go up, and President Clinton says, the battle, unfortunately, we have no results. I had a long discussion with President Demirel at the time, and President Demirel said, we cannot reopen Khalki because this is not the proper time and because we don't have the proper legal formula. I have seen President Clinton many times. I never saw him with such a gloomy face. And this is Clinton too. Well, that was the case. I mentioned this in order to show that already from that time and before that, we have a continuous involvement of the American government in the issue of freedom of the and especially in the country. It continued with President Bush many times. And it continued with President Obama. A few years back, President Obama visited Constantinople. There was something to do with a number of issues there. And we had a meeting, a very private meeting. President Obama, and at that time it was Mr. Manuel, Chief of Staff, and it was a patriarch, and I had the honor to be myself, the four of us. It was a 15 minute meeting. And President Obama repeated what President Clinton, President Bush, and himself said many times that we are committed to the issue of Khaki and to the other open issues, which are the title ecumenical for the patriarchy, a title which was not invented, but it was a matter of fact, established in the 6th century. So he was having a title for 1,500 years in a patriarchate which had a continuity. The patriarch is a 260th patriarch without any interruption. There is a continuous thing. There is no justification for a title to stop existing. So you have the ecumenical title, you have the confiscation of property, very extensive, you have the legal status, and you have Harki. Harki seems to be the most easy thing to do. In a meeting in Constantinople, Istanbul, in the Hilton, organized by the Patriarchate and the European Parliament. The head at that time of the European Parliament, Mr. Petri, addressing the minister, the minister from the Turkey government that was there, he said, the reopening of Khalki and the solution of these items is not a matter that needs even days, could be done tomorrow. The theory, the myth of legal formulas and things like that is really non-existent. And that was verified by Prime Minister Erdogan, who said it's not a matter 
of any other issues. It's a political decision. So we have this. And the discussion, the 15 minute discussion with President Obama, again, it was political. <coughs> and in fact, President Obama spoke to the parliament, the Turkish parliament, at that time, measuring hardship specifically. Something which I am sure irritated uh, as it was somehow expected, the Turkish. So we have on the part of the American government, especially the presidents and the secretaries of state. We have meetings with Colin Powell, Ms. Rice, Mrs. Clinton for hours. The Arpons were there and other members. It was always a very clean committee last year. And we have a meeting with Prime Minister Erdogan here in Europe last year. And we thank him for that. And he gave us a, an astonishing answer. He said, this was not a favor. That was a restoration of some injustice. That's a thing. That's important. <coughs> so this is this is the, the, the history, or rather, this is the drama of this hard thing. It becomes an international special drama, having all the characteristics of a drama, prolonged unnecessarily victim of wrong policies and stubborn insistence of something that has no good repercussions for Turkey. And that was the main issue advocated from the American side and from our side. Opening hierarchy is a great thing for Turkey. It would be a tremendous achievement if it It's not something that would be just a favor. Chairman Rice used a phrase at the beginning. You said this is an issue that closes the doors for the future generation. Please keep this sentence. Closing the doors for the future generation. Many of you can somehow be patient with one year, two years, even ten years. But blocking future generations is something which is just unacceptable. Impossible. In what right you block out the future generation? But this is the case. So thank you for being here. Thank you for opening time. Thank you close with something just to make it a little more humorous the other. So you don't want to talk somehow to project gloomy things. So pleased to be here with uh, Gaspar Arrakis, uh, the co-chair of the caucus, and, and the, the, the importance of the Okay, is so incredibly important. I, when I was met with the Patriarchate two years ago, he told me that, that Turkey was promising to open up the school. And, and my question uh, to everyone, is this just a, a repeat re performance? Because they, when I left, when I left Turkey, they said, when you come back, you'll be able to go to Halke and it will be opened. And that, that was two years ago. Yet the whole time I have been in Congress, we have been working to get it open in a, in a bipartisan way and to also honor the patriarchy and have the, the, the powers returned to them to run the church in the way that they want to run the church. They had all these restrictions that you could not be uh, uh, you know, a leader in the church unless you were born in Constantinople, but, but the church is representing uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people across the world uh, that are part of... of of, 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 the, of the church. And uh, uh, this is uh, such an important thing. I have a long speech. I'm going to put this up on my website. You can all read it if you'd like. But I'd just like to welcome his em eminence. Your words are really spoke for the truth. And, and uh, my question really for anyone to answer, is that a repeat occurrence that they promised to open it up? Even the Turkish government was telling you they were going to open it up. And then it just never seems to happen. And why are they not honoring something as important as a religious institution that they continue to say they are, and yet they don't. So that's my question. Thank you. I was just in Istanbul during July with the Helsinki Commission. I continue to be chairman of the Helsinki Commission, co-chairmanship with the Senate, and, and raised issues with our hosts, which were the Turks, uh, about how, and got all kinds of statements along the lines of, well, 
uh, we're moving in the right direction. You know, the conditionality wasn't raised the way it is being raised now. Uh, but it looked like it was a matter of, uh, not a matter of when or if it was, it was, it was going to happen imminently. And uh, obviously that has been dashed at least temporarily. Uh, we are, you know, I, yesterday I chaired a hearing on uh, the Central African Republic. We had Bishop Nuno, Nuno come and testify. The Christians are being slaughtered uh, throughout. It is mostly outside Islamists who are doing it. It's not indigenous Muslims. Five weeks ago, six weeks ago, I was in Nigeria and went to Jos, where churches are being firebombed uh, and Christians are being killed. We actually brought last week a man to the hearing uh, who literally was almost martyred. Uh, Boko Haram, one of their adherents, put a, a AK-47 to his head and told him to renounce his faith as a Christian. Uh, and if you do so and become a Muslim, I'll spare your life. He said, I'm ready to see my Lord. He pulled the trigger, blew out his nose, and he shows the scars to this moment, uh, and gave unbelievably compelling testimony. There was a global attack on Christians, and the Greek Orthodox Church has known that prejudice and that discrimination uh, for decades, for centuries, really. Uh, but decades, certainly, uh, with the Turkish governments. I have the first hearing ever on the issue of the Armenian Genocide. And you talk about, because I meet with the Turks all the time, they're diplomats, um, they were threatening to take away our base in Israel uh, as a quid pro quo if we recognized uh, the genocide that occurred against the Armenians. So I'm going to tell you, Mike, uh, Gus Belarakis, like his father before him, uh, uh, Mike, uh, and many others in this Congress, and like Senator Sarbanes did so famously for so many years, are fighting aggressively on behalf of the Greek Orthodox Church uh, I know it's bipartisan to the hilt, and that's the way it ought to be. Uh, because and Frank Wolf, you mentioned being with Frank, uh, I find it appalling that this administration has not designated CPCs, countries of particular concern. Vietnam should be there for what they're doing to the Christians, particularly the Montagnard. So all across the planet, we're seeing an elevated persecution of people simply because they're Christians. I have a hearing, it'll be my fourth one, on the Coptics on December 10th, Human Rights Day. And Bishop Angelis and, 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 and uh, Angelis is going to be one of our, he's flying in from London uh, to speak about what is happening to the Coptic Christians, first under Morsi, which was horrible, but now even under the uh, military government. So, no, Your Eminence, we're in absolute solidarity with you. The bipartisan caucus speaks out every day. Uh, today's uh, resolution that passed, uh, I think, is a good step in, in the right direction. Uh, I'm sure it'll be you know, on the floor, hopefully. Regards to Hockey very, very soon, and uh, we, we will persist. And thank you for your leadership. Well, I thought it was uh, uh, very important that we organize this briefing, uh, and uh, the Archbishop did a wonderful job as usual, and uh, Archon Jimenakis uh, uh, did a fantastic job explaining the issue, as well as Elizabeth uh, Lomos. This is so very important. The mice, the seminary, it has to do with the succession. Uh, and we got to make sure that we open it as soon as possible. Uh, we've heard from uh, several prime ministers of Turkey over the years. We can go back 15 years at least. But we want action now, not words. So uh, I felt it was very important to sponsor the resolution again this year to open up the theological school without any conditions. Uh, and uh, I did it last year. We passed it out of the Foreign Affairs Committee. But this year we wanted to get passed, get onto the floor and pass it out of the House of Representatives. And I think it will send a message to Turkey. The uh, ranking member, uh, actually Signal, I mean, the chairman of the, the uh, subcommittee on Europe under the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, spoke yesterday when I presented my bill before the committee, and he was for us, he has co-sponsored the bill, and he says he will advocate on our behalf. As you know, Chairman Royce, Ed Royce, and the ranking member of the, the full quote, Foreign Affairs Committee, Ali Elingo, Itanedo, Simraki, Royce, Itanemandimas, they are strong supporters of Greece, strong supporters of Rathriskia, the Patriarchate, and of course opening up the Skoli. We realize how important it is to us. Ixerite, you know, it's something that I was reading over the other night. The school opened up in 1844. That was during the Ottoman Empire. Metato Polemo, just a few years after the Greek War of Independence. 
and stayed open all those years up until 1971. And it's amazing the Turks, the Turkey says that it's a free and secular society. Well, why is this Swali, which is so, so important to Eastern Orthodox Christians around the world, why is this Swali not open? We will not rest until we open up our Swali. Now, I will tell you that uh, it's important to Orthodox Christians around the United States, 300 million around the world, but also Polus, alienists, but also non alienists who are Orthodox Christians. So uh, again, I'm getting quite a few people. It's a bipartisan bill, and we have the momentum, and we're not going to rest until it gets done. Thank you. Finished a very interesting meeting in which we have prominent members of the Congress, and especially, especially congressmen that are responsible for external affairs, and we raised and discussed the issue of uh, the Halki. Uh, it was more than Halki, it was the issue of religious freedom of the Ecumenical Patriarchate and uh, Dr. Anthony Liberakis and Dr. Prothromo respectively presented two very carefully done presentations about the conditions related to Halki and uh, its opening and also to the general issue of the Patriarchate. And we have also uh, some of the present, congressmen present spoke and spoke very eloquently and in fact very passionately about the need to resolve the issue and have not only uh, Halki reopen but also create the possibility for the ecumenical patriarchy to function in freedom and possibility of developing the very important progress programs that the patriarchate has for the uh, uh, reconciliation among the people, or for the peaceful coexistence of the people, for the possibility of everyone to have the freedom of conscience and the freedom of religious practice. We are thankful to the members of the Congress and especially to our congressman, Mr. Gas Bilirakis, who had the initiative to organize this meeting. We pray that God will help all the people working on this issue to see soon the positive and wished for results. Well, I want to commend the Congressman Bilirakis and the entire Hellenic Caucus for holding this hearing. It's very important to focus attention on the denial of religious freedom which is taking place in Turkey. I mean, it's contrary to treaty obligations, it's contrary to basic principles of human rights and basic principles of religious freedom. And, uh, you know, they've closed the seminary at Halki, uh, which is a clear denial of their responsibilities under these international obligations. And I think the Hellenic Caucus is doing an important service here by focusing attention on this. Uh, they had the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee here for the event and other members of the House of Representatives. So we have to keep working at this and they're, they're doing a good job of it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator.